Congratulations, Rashir, another book out. Uh, so let's talk about exactly the thesis of this book, because it is a statement, not a question about what went wrong. So what has gone wrong? How do you know it's gone wrong? When I look at the poll numbers, for example, that on one hand you have like all, you know, all this great data that the American economy is relatively resilient, uh, but if you look at the number of people who are happy in America with the state of the economic union, it is at close to record lows according to many polls. There are about 7 in 10 Americans today who want the major change to the economic system or, in the language of the polls, have it completely toned down. You know, that's pretty dramatic. There are uh, only about 35% or so Americans today who feel that they're going to be better off than their parents. Uh, 50, 60 years ago, about 70, 80% of Americans felt that they're going to be better off than their parents. So there's a real feeling that something has gone wrong. And I think that it's particularly the fact to do with capitalism, that most young Democrats, in particular in America today, say they would rather have socialism than have capitalism. Now, that's such a big statement for uh, this beacon of American capitalism and all that we've spoken about of global capitalism, rather, they are saying that they would rather have socialism, a, a large cohort of the millennials and the young people, rather than have capitalism. So something has gone wrong. And what I've done in this book is to sort of look at deep down what's gone wrong. Because, as they say, the first step to a cure is to first diagnose the problem. Uh, but I feel that in America today, we're not even diagnosing what the underlying problem is. Why does it make sense, from your point of view, having studied this now, if, if you didn't know anything about our society, if you didn't read any of the media, you didn't read any of the polls, and you looked at our growth rate, which is at or above historical trend lines, and you looked at unemployment, which is close to lows of all time, most indications would say this should be a pretty happy economy. So why is it not? Exactly. So, because after I said that there's a sliver at the top which is doing very well, but we have this two-track economy out here uh, that even now, if you look at it, you know, the bottom 50 to 60 percent, they don't have any excess savings. Uh, they're not being able to spend that much. And as I said, that you know, there's a feeling that they're being squashed by what's happening at the top, that today in America, economic mobility, social mobility, all have de declined significantly. Like, this is a country where people would move around a lot or people would be in search of an opportunity. As I said, there's a real feeling in America today that they don't have equality of opportunity. Is it the government's fault in, in this sense? 2008, 2009, we had the great financial crisis. There was concern about a depression, not just a great recession, but a depression. And there was a lot of government intervention, both in the monetary side and the fiscal side. A lot of people thought that was necessary to save us and maybe the world from depression. Then you had a pandemic, and we brought the economy to a stop. Uh, and again, it was thought there needed to be a lot of stimulus. Was it the government's fault? Didn't they need to come in and have this level of uh, stimulus and support? Yeah, as I say in the book, that when we have a crisis, I can understand that the government needs to intervene. I'm not a kind of person who's you know, a liquidationist that you just let things sort of you know, go uh, and melt away on its own. What I'm trying to what I've shown in the book is just look at the progression of capitalism over the last hundred years. We have gone from this liquidationist argument, which caused the Great Depression in, in the 1930s, to now an impulse where you liquefy, liquefy, liquefy. That the moment you uh, have even the slightest crisis, like you had last year with the uh, SVB or something, the impulse is that we got to intervene, we got to save. And the problem is that we only have one case point which is what we use all the time to justify intervention, which is that we think if we don't intervene, we'll have another Great Depression. That is the argument used all the time. But what's the result today? The result today is the fact that bankruptcies are close to a record low. We have the number of new startups instead, which have been coming up right about until the pandemic, you know, like have been declining. So if you keep so much deadwood alive, and you keep so many incumbents and entrenched billionaires and oligopolies alive, you're not allowing new uh, things to really surface. And the middle, in particular, is getting squeezed. So the argument in the book is that you're right, that when we have an, a crisis, you need some government help. But this is not just about crisis. This is about every time there's a minor flutter, you end up getting government intervention. And it's not just about government spending, as I said. Look at the amount of regulations every year. Uh, like in America, we introduced 3,000 new regulations. We, uh, how many regulations have we withdrawn over the last 20 years? 20 in total, right? So we got a regulatory state, 
a bailout nation that in America in the 60s and 70s and all, bailing out a private sector company in America was considered heretical. We are America, we don't do this. Then you begin with the 1984 first big financial uh, institution bailout in terms of continental Illinois. And after that, progressively, every time you have a crisis, the bailouts get bigger. And so that's again sort of, you know, leaves a feeling with people that are we really a bailout nation? And if these, you know, rich uh, corporates are getting bailed out, the average person thinks, why am I not getting more out of this? So it's about regulation. It's about uh, bailouts. It's about government spending, which has gone up from 3% of GDP 100 years ago to 36% of GDP today. Through every administration, we almost... Uh, regarding some air pockets here or the other, we have seen an increase in government spending. Every administration, including Reagan, because people tend to think of Ronald Reagan as being a smaller government uh, philosophy. Yeah, but the facts just don't bear it out, because under his administration, government spending increases slowed down a bit, but they kept on sort of, you know, uh, carrying on at pretty high levels. Uh, and then if you look at it in terms of what happened under him as far as regulations were concerned, even though under Reagan too, those kept on going up. The only deregulation we saw was the financial sector. The financial sector saw lots of deregulation, but outside of that, for the small and medium-sized businesses, the regulatory burden has kept getting bigger. And this has real consequences, David, because it means that if you're looking to start a new business, the cost of doing that today is way higher uh, uh, on Wall Street. Where, uh, for example, if you're looking to start a fund today, it's 10 times uh, in terms of the cost compared to 20 years ago. So, you know, that just means that if you're already in business or if you're a big person in business, you're able to benefit. So capitalism today in its distorted form has become pro-incumbent and it has become uh, pro-big business. Whereas in its true form, capitalism should be pro-competition and pro-churn. Uh, the, the title of the book is What Went Wrong with Capitalism. I, I take it as one of a tenet of capitalism that growth is usually the way out. That if we grow the entire pie, most problems will take care of themselves. Doesn't the government's support facilitate growth? Isn't that the way to get growth? Yeah, but as I said, that, uh, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So yes, the government's intentions may be okay, but as I show in the book, that where should the government intervention stop? because it's progressively gotten worse and worse, right? So which is the fact that, should it stop now? Uh, what's the place where the government's possibly even bigger? Europe, do we want, to, but America's welfare state now is pretty much catching up with that of Europe. So do we want to go the European way with even lower productivity? At the end of the day, you're right. What leads to higher economic growth? It is higher productivity. That's the single most important thing. And productivity is being undermined by the fact that you have the creative, destructive fiber of this economy being destroyed by repeated government intervention. And, you know, like we spoke about in the old days about the invisible hand, it still appears to many people as invisible. But what I've tried to do in the book is to show the progression of this, that the government's hand is now there in a way which was unimaginable even 20, 30 years ago. In the book, you say uh, democracy is not the problem. Capitalism is the problem. But I wonder if you can divorce the two of them, really. We have elected representatives. It's going to be awfully easy for them to give us things in order to get reelected. And doesn't that support more government support, more government intervention? Logically, yes, but I also make the point, right, which is that today, if you look at what's happened to leaders around the world, including in the United States, approval ratings of leaders in the Western world, in the so-called capitalist nations, is close to a record low. Most incumbents now are losing their re-election. So clearly the status quo, the current system we have, is not working for many people. So, this, so then democracy is also giving you an indicator here, which is that the status quo is not working for us. So we can carry on with the status quo, but then the uh, political leaders should know that people are not happy with status quo and therefore are willing to support people who are willing to be disruptive even if the disruption is sort of chaotic. Um, and the risk of them getting re-elected has gone down significantly. About, you know, uh, 15, 20 years ago, the probability that if you were an incumbent of getting re-elected was 70%. Today, the probability of getting re-elected if you're an incumbent is, I think, 35%. So that's a dramatic low in terms of what's happened. So the status quo is not what's working for people, and democracy is telling you that that's just not going to be acceptable to many people.